We all know that having to drop what you're doing to make a run to the post office is a major pain, especially when you have more important things to do. So stop mailing and shipping the hard way. Stamps.com is your 24-7 post office that you can access from anywhere. Skip the headache with Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you save time, money, and stress. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over one million businesses. With Stamps.com, you can discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS. So whether you're an office sending invoices, an Etsy shop sending your products, or a warehouse shipping out orders, make mailing and shipping a breeze. All you need is your regular computer and printer. No special supplies or equipment is required. Plus, Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. Don't mail and ship the hard way. Sign up with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code killer for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code killer. Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not going to want to miss it. Now, you guys, as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are discussing the brutally horrific case of Zara Baker. This case was actually recommended by a Killer Instinct listener, and if you don't know, you can always email me at killerinstinctpodcast at gmail.com, or you can send in requests to the Killer Instinct Instagram page. I take requests there as well. And when I got this request, I quickly looked into it and I looked at what the premise of the case was and I was absolutely horrified. There's so much that goes into this case and while it is necessarily a solved case, there are still so many questions about what exactly happened to Zara Baker. So I'm very interested to see what you guys have to say about this one. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Zara Claire Baker was born on November 16th, 1999 in a town called Wagga Wagga, located in New South Wales, Australia, to her parents, Emily Dietrich and Adam Baker. Now, similar to a lot of parents, Emily dealt with some pretty severe postpartum depression after she gave birth to Zara, and because of that, she figured that the best thing to do for her daughter would be to give custody to Adam, her father. So Adam got full custody of Zara, and this was definitely not something that he expected or was in his plans, and he knew that in order to raise Zara, he was going to need a village. He was going to need support. So he decided to move back in with his parents so his parents could help him raise Zara as well. His parents lived in Queensland, so that is where him and Zara moved to, and Adam started working for a sugar mill. So that was what life looked like from 1999 to 2005, when unexpectedly, Zara was diagnosed with bone cancer at only six years old. Shortly after she was diagnosed with the bone cancer, she was then diagnosed with lung cancer as well. And as a result of this, she had to have her left leg amputated as well as part of her lung removed. And she also had to wear hearing aids because the chemotherapy robbed her of her hearing. Now, this is something that no human deserves to go through, period, but especially a child. By six years old, Zara had already experienced more adversity than the average human does in their lifetime. But regardless of the obstacles that were thrown at Zara, she always handled them with such grace. 
She was a very optimistic little girl. She was described as upbeat and sunny, and she had a little sass to her. She had a little spunk. And with being raised by a single dad, her and Adam had a very, very close bond and relationship. They loved playing games together and just doing daily activities together, and Adam was always there to cater to Zara's needs and never treated her like she was any less because of the struggles that she faced. And Zara was really the light of Adam's life, and obviously it came with his challenges. However, Adam really stepped up to the plate in the first few years of Zara's life and really took care of his daughter. Now that all brings us to 2007, and during 2007, Adam decided to get back out onto the dating scene, but with a young daughter, it was hard, so he decided to try online dating. He ended up signing up for one of those international online dating websites, and when he did that, he was able to connect with a woman in North Carolina, and this woman's name is Elisa Fairchild, and I'm just going to put it out there right now. Elisa, she's a Looney Tune, to put it lightly. Elisa grew up being the middle child of two sisters, and those who knew her growing up said that she was a master manipulator and a compulsive liar. Now, when Elisa met Adam, she had a family of her own. In total, she had three children, and these three children were a result of her six marriages. Elisa had been married six times before she met Adam, and from the years 2004 to 2007, so within three years, she was married three times. But according to Elisa, when she met Adam, she thought she met her Prince Charming. She ended up making a trip to Australia to visit Adam and Zara, and that is where she said she really fell in love with Adam. She loved the fact that Adam was a single dad and loved how devoted he was to Zara. Elisa said that this quality of Adam's really attracted her to him because she was a mother herself and watching a single father be so caring towards his daughter, especially with Zara's condition, was very attractive to her. And on the flip side, when Adam met Elisa, he thought that Elisa was the missing puzzle piece that was going to complete their family. He thought that this was a perfect opportunity to give Zara the motherly figure that she deserved in her life. He claims that he envisioned a loving family with siblings for Zara, and they were all going to grow up together and be this one big happy family. Now by 2008, so one year after Adam and Elisa got together, Zara actually went into remission for her cancer. And when that happened, Adam decided that he and Zara were going to make the move to North Carolina to be with Elisa. And that's exactly what they did. They packed up all of their stuff in Australia and made the move to North Carolina where Adam and Elisa got married. So Adam became husband number seven. Now going from Australia to small town Hickory, North Carolina was a very big jump for Zara. It was a very big change. She didn't know anyone, obviously, and it was a very challenging time for her. However, Zara had faced many more taxing obstacles in her life, so she again handled it with grace, but she wasn't necessarily stoked to have to leave Australia. Now, what Adam didn't know when he moved to North Carolina and married Elisa is that Elisa was actually still legally married to her sixth husband when she married Adam, which by the way, is illegal. Now, Elisa claimed that she thought that her sixth husband, a man named Aaron Young, had filed for divorce when she had gone to Australia to visit Adam for the first time. So she claims she went to Australia, she thought Aaron filed for divorce, but he just didn't. Now this story has some holes in it when you learn that Elisa and Aaron still remained very close friends when Elisa and Adam got married. So much so that Elisa introduced Aaron to Adam, not as her ex-husband, but as her brother. 
According to Elisa, she did this because Aaron wanted to be a part of Zara's life. And Elisa knew that Adam wouldn't be comfortable with Elisa's ex-husband hanging around all the time. And so in order to make Adam more comfortable and to make Aaron happy, she decided to introduce Aaron as her brother. And if you're sitting there thinking, Savannah, that doesn't make sense. I know, but bear with me. So Adam, Zara, and Elisa are now living in Hickory, North Carolina in a house together. And this meant that Elisa was now Zara's stepmother. And according to Elisa, her and Zara hit it off right from the start. And Elisa said that she loved the fact that Zara always had a smile on her face and again, had a certain spunk about her and she never gave up. Elisa said that even her own biological children sometimes got jealous over the fact that they believed that Zara was getting a special treatment and that they were jealous over the bond that Zara had with their mother. However, despite how Elisa recounts these events, there were actually a lot of reports of physical abuse going on in that house. Zara had attended public school, and oftentimes teachers would notice different markings on her, and CPS was actually called to the home on four different occasions to investigate claims that Zara was being abused. A teacher at one point had even given Zara her personal phone number and said, if anything is ever going on, you can call me. It was even said that one day Zara came to school with a black eye. Now neighbors confirmed all this, saying that they would see Elisa physically and mentally abuse and neglect Zara, and that they had approached her on several occasions and told her to stop. However, she just brushed them off and did not care. It was said that Elisa had a bad temper and she acted fast with physical punishment. Another friend claimed that she saw Elisa with a swollen hand one time and when she asked her about it, Elisa said that she was trying to spank Zara. However, instead of hitting her, she accidentally hit her prosthetic leg. Elisa also stated that she told Adam that instead of the real story of her trying to hit Zara, she told Adam that she fell down the stairs and that's why her hand was so swollen because she knew that if she told Adam the truth, Adam would be very angry. Now, this is not the first time that Elisa had allegations like this against her because social services had actually been investigating Lisa since 1999 in regards to alleged abuse of her other three biological children. So Elisa was already on police radar. So this all brings us to October 9th, 2010 at about 5.30 a.m. Okay guys, listen up. If you are the type of person that keeps on saying how you need to make a budget but you never do, and if somehow you keep missing credit card payments, or if you're afraid to look at your bank statement, then it is time to take back control of your financial life. Meet Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, our favorite financial app. So you might be sitting here wondering why Truebill changed its name to Rocket Money. Well, we will tell you what we heard. Truebill, now backed by Rocket Companies, has grown from a bill management app into a full-on personal finance empowerment tool that helps over 3.4 million people with budgeting, lowering bills, canceling subscriptions, and more, saving each of their members on average $700 a year. And with all of that growth comes the next evolution in Truebill's story, a new name. So bottom line, Rocket Money is everything I've loved about Truebill, but with a fresh look and feel. So start canceling your unused subscriptions and save money at rocketmoney.com slash killer. Again, that is rocketmoney.com slash killer. Or you can download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Police were called in regards to a fire that Elisa said had been started in the back of their home. Police rushed over to the scene and were able to put out the fire, and then they left. Now, 911 received another phone call 
from the Baker household at around 2 p.m. the same day, but this time it was Adam who was calling. Adam had called the police and reported that Zara was missing. Now, police again arrived to the house for the second time that day to speak with Adam, and he told police that he found a ransom note. Now, this ransom note was found on the windshield of the company car that Adam drove. And this ransom note was very confusing because even though it was found on the windshield of the car that Adam drove, the ransom note was directed towards Adam's boss, a man named Mark Coffey. The ransom note was asking for $1 million in exchange for Mark Coffey's daughter. However, this didn't make any sense for multiple reasons. The first one being it was on the car that Adam was driving, but also because police went and checked in with Mark and found that his daughter was safe and sound in her room. So this ransom note right off the bat didn't make sense. However, when Adam was talking to police, he thought that it was possible that whoever started the fire earlier that morning did so in order to make a distraction so they could take Zara. He also claimed that whoever wrote this ransom note, which had to be the same person, must have mistaken Zara for Mark Coffey's daughter. Now, despite the confusion that came with this ransom note, all police knew at that point was that Zara Baker was missing and the investigation kicked off right away. The following day, police interviewed both Adam and Elisa, as well as brought in cadaver dogs to their home. Now, the dogs did give off positive alerts, which indicate human remains. The positive alerts were given off on both Elisa and Adam's cars. Now, there was also blood spatter found in Zara's bedroom. It was found on the ceiling, and police were actually able to swab that for evidence. Now, Elisa was given a polygraph test in regards to her knowledge on Zara's disappearance. She was asked if she was involved in Zara's disappearance. She was also asked if she knew if anyone else was involved in Zara's disappearance. She was asked if she knew Zara's whereabouts, and she was asked if she wrote the ransom note. She answered no to all of those questions and she failed every single one. On October 11th, Adam Baker appeared on Good Morning America pleading with anyone who could provide details of Zara's disappearance. And he also didn't rule out the possibility that Elisa could have been involved in Zara's disappearance in this interview. When the host of Good Morning America asked him if Elisa was involved, he simply stated, I don't know. Now, the investigators hope that Zara was going to be found alive and well, diminished quickly. They sent out an Amber Alert the first day that Zara was reported missing. However, on October 12th, so just three days after the Amber Alert was set out, police canceled the Amber Alert and changed the investigation from a missing persons investigation to a homicide investigation. They knew that the likelihood that Zara was going to come back alive was very, very slim. And they also knew that due to her conditions, she wouldn't be able to survive survive on her own for very long. So because of the switch in the investigation, police now brought in divers to search through draining ponds, large wooded areas, and landfills, hoping to find Zara. Now, due to police's suspicions about Elisa, they looked into her record and they were able to figure out that she had some outstanding warrants for charges such as larceny, driving with a revoked license, and writing bad checks. So because of that, they were able to arrest her. And when she was arrested, Elisa confessed to police that she was the one who wrote the ransom note. She said she tried to do it in order to send police astray and on a wild goose chase. And then on October 25th, so a couple days later, police also arrested Adam Baker for charges not related to Zara's disappearance. At this point, it seemed as if the police just wanted to have Elisa and Adam in custody in order for them not to flee. And because this case was so confusing, police didn't know who to believe. Now, police continued their search, and one day after Adam was arrested on October 26th, 
Police discovered a prosthetic leg in Caldwell County, which is about a half an hour drive from where the Bakers lived. Police were able to confirm that the leg did belong to Zara. And then a couple weeks later, on November 3rd and November 10th, 2010, the rest of her remains were recovered at two other sites in Caldwell County. And the person that was able to direct police as to where to find Zara's remains, that would be Elisa Fairchild. On November 30th, police held a press conference and released information to the public that Zara had been dismembered. But now this leads us to the question of how and why and how did we get here and that all wasn't made public until January 5th, 2011. And what was made public will truly shock you. We all know that having to drop what you're doing to make a run to the post office is a major pain, especially when you have more important things to do. So stop mailing and shipping the hard way. Stamps.com is your 24-7 post office that you can access from anywhere. Skip the headache with Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you save time, money, and stress. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over one million businesses. With Stamps.com, you get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS. So whether you're an office sending invoices, an Etsy shop sending your products, or a warehouse shipping out orders, make mailing and shipping a breeze. All you need is your regular computer and printer. No special supplies or equipment is required. Plus, Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. Don't mail and ship the hard way. Sign up with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code killer for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code killer. On January 5th, 2011, police revealed to the public that Zara Baker had been dismembered in her own home on September 24th, 2010. Now you might be confused because earlier, as we stated, Zara wasn't reported missing until October 9th. So that's about two weeks before Zara went missing. Now, when police looked into it, they realized that they couldn't account for Zara at all or what her whereabouts were for a month leading up to October 9th, 2010. Zara had been taken out of public school by Adam and Elisa, and it is believed that the reason for that was due to the accusations of abuse that were being directed at Elisa. Police thought that Adam and Elisa pulled her out because they were tired of the accusations and alleged abuse being thrown at them. Now, due to the nature of how Zara's body was discovered, police were not able to determine what her original cause of death was. However, according to Elisa, she had her own story of what happened that day. She claimed on the 24th of September, she had left Zara home alone while she went out running errands and she returned later that afternoon. She claimed that when she returned home, she walked by Zara's bedroom and noticed that Zara was laying on her bed and not moving. Elisa claimed she called out to Zara a couple of times but didn't get an answer. So she walked over to Zara and noticed that she wasn't breathing. Elisa said that's when things got very frantic and she immediately started performing CPR on Zara but didn't call 911. And she claimed the reason she didn't do that was just simply out of fear. Elisa said once she stopped CPR and knew that Zara was officially dead, that Adam was then the one to dismember his own daughter. Elisa claimed that after Adam dismembered Zara, that he forced her into the car with him with Zara's remains and forced her to help him scatter them over a wooded area in Caldwell County. 
Now, Elisa's story and the claim that Adam was the one involved really gets disputed when you look at phone records because GPS phone records show that on September 24th, during the time period that this would have happened, Adam was at work. His phone shows that he was 20 miles away at his job and witnesses attest to seeing him there that day. Now, not only that, Phone records also show that Elisa's phone was in Caldwell County where the remains were recovered during the time period. So Adam's phone was not there, but Elisa's phone was. And phone records also show that Elisa tried to call Adam nine times that day. So why would she need to call him nine times if he was right next to her? Now, Adam adamantly denies having any involvement in his daughter's death, and if you're like me sitting here wondering, how on earth did this man not know that his daughter was missing for two whole weeks before she was reported? He claims he was constantly working, he was in and out of the house, and Zara was also at that point in her life where she was going into her preteen and teenage years. She spent a lot of time in her bedroom and didn't like to come out of it, essentially. However, despite that statement, you do have to think it's a little bizarre that Adam wouldn't check on Zara for two weeks after not seeing her and living in the same house. That's the part I can't wrap my head around. Adam did work odd hours. However, Adam claimed on October 9th that he last saw Zara at 2.30 in the morning when he left for work. Now, Elisa's aunt also came forward and confirmed Elisa's side of the story. She said that Elisa confessed to her that Zara had been sick for two weeks leading up to September 24th before she died. Elisa claimed that she died of a sickness on September 24th, and then once Adam and Elisa figured it out, they both just quote unquote, went wild and dismembered her. But again, that's contradicting to the phone records that show that Adam was not there during this time. And it does show that Elisa was at the disposal site. Now, as far as what investigators believe, they truly believe that Elisa Baker killed and dismembered Zara Baker on September 24th, 2010, and disposed of her remains the same day. Now, Elisa was arrested and charged for second-degree murder with aggravating circumstances on February 22nd, 2011. The reason she got the second degree instead of first-degree murder was because she helped authorities find Zara's remains once she was arrested. Now, police could not find any credible evidence that Adam was involved, so he did not get charged with anything in relation to Zara's death. However, two months after Elisa got charged, In April of 2011, Adam got charged with identity theft of Elisa's son-in-law. He also was charged with passing false checks, threats, assault with a deadly weapon, and failure to return property. However, to this day, he claims he has absolutely nothing to do with Zara's death. But on the flip side, to this day, Elisa claims that he did have something to do with Zara's death. However, regardless of all of this, Adam has since returned to Australia. Now, instead of going to trial, Elisa ended up taking a plea deal to avoid the death penalty, and she only got 18 years for this. 18 years in prison for the dismemberment of a child. Now, again, we don't know exactly how Zara died. All we know is that she was brutally dismembered after she died. And for what reason? That's the biggest question here is that let's say Zara did get sick and she passed away from an illness. Why on earth, instead of calling 911, would you decide to dismember her instead? You can't make that one make sense. Now, in 2013, Elisa did get sentenced to an additional 10 years in prison for drug-related charges, so she is going to be incarcerated for a little while longer. However, still, it does not seem like enough time. Now, since all of this, Zara's biological mother has actually spoken out. She spoke out in 2010. Now, Emily, 
Zara's biological mother, stated that when she gave Adam custody, she was not under the impression that she was never going to see her daughter again. She thought that by giving Adam custody, she was giving Zara the best life possible. However, she still thought that she would be able to see her daughter when she wanted to. However, she claimed that every time she tried to see Zara, Adam continuously kept her from Emily. And that, you guys, is the case of Zara Baker. This one definitely gets me heated up because I feel like there's still so many unanswered questions and just things that don't make sense. Again, if Zara was sick for two weeks and died, why did they dismember her? How did Adam not know his daughter was missing for two weeks? The list goes on and on, but I'm so curious to hear what you guys have to say about this one. So with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not gonna wanna miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new case for you guys and until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Thank you.